This moment is a tipping point to change America and see if America truly believes in the words of Thomas Jefferson, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equally. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! When somebody says they can't breathe, what is it about that statement that should not be believed? Good afternoon and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Robert Samuels, a national political enterprise reporter at The Post and co-author of the new book, His Name is George Floyd, One Man's Life and the Struggle for Racial Justice. Joining us today in our latest installment of our Race in America series, Ben Crump, lead attorney for the Floyd family and Antonio Romanucci, co-counsel for the family. Uh, gentlemen, it's so great to see you. It's it's been a while. It's good to see great you. Great to see well, you, Mark. Robert. Thanks. Um, you know, watching those videos, I was behind you, shadowing you guys for a number of them, and it's hard to believe it's been two years since uh, the death of George Floyd. On the top of the video, we saw his words to his sister Jaja about wanting to touch the world. Two years ago, he did just that. And I wanted to start with you, uh, Attorney Crump, in talking about what do you think has changed in these two years and what hasn't changed? Well, I think what we've seen is a greater awareness from some people who did not believe uh, marginalized people, black people, when they said the police treat us uh, inhumanely. They treat us brutally. Uh, that George Floyd video of him being tortured to death, as Tony Ramanucci, my dear friend and co-counsel, have talked many of times, it was a documentary of his death that George Floyd narrated of his death. And so that's the biggest thing that has changed, that people have greater awareness that black people and brown people aren't lying when they say the police torture them and treat them uh, with no respect, no consideration, no professionalism, and in times with no humanity. What has not changed is the number of killings that continue to happen against uh, citizens by the people who are supposed to protect and serve them. And disproportionately, Robert, and I know most people know this, it happens to black and brown people. The fact that based on your polls that, you know, we're set on a record high for police killings in this year. This is, you know, the second year after George Floyd when we really believed that it was going to be a wake-up call where a tipping point where we didn't see so many of these unjust, highly questionable killings by police. But we still have work to do. I know, Tony, I, I continue to say, you know, very honestly, regrettably, that it's been two years and Black people still can't breathe because we haven't got that George Floyd police reform bill passed by the United States Congress, which so many of us were so optimistic about. And so we have to continue to try to raise awareness. We have to do what Lorraine Hansberry said, is shout from the mountaintop when those politicians come in our neighborhoods trying to get us to vote to say, what we want from you is to give us the same uh, professional uh, 
courtesy, consideration, and most of all, the same constitutional promises that you give to our white brothers and sisters. Attorney Romanucci, uh, you two are quite the dynamic duo when it comes to thinking about these cases and taking them thinking about them aggressively. When you think about what transpired to George Floyd and how you went about pursuing justice for him in the courtroom, and you think about all these cases that have happened since, I'm wondering if you think about how to try them differently. Has anything changed in terms of your principles in how to go about seeking uh, some semblance of accountability for police? Well, Robert, I mean, excellent question. I don't think there's any doubt that George Floyd not only transformed the world into what we know as to what Ben just referred. I mean, you know, the awareness level from a public standpoint is, is tremendous. But from a legal standpoint, it has changed what we do because George Floyd in and of itself, this chronicle of a murder, this, this, this watch party that the world had watching this man being killed slowly over nine and a half minutes during a pandemic while everybody had all the time in the world to watch this has changed the way we have to approach these cases from a legal standpoint. And you use the word aggressive. There's no other way to handle these cases now, but very aggressively. And that's doing as much research as possible early on in the case and getting community feedback, what lawyers uh, refer to as focus groups or mock trials as early as possible and understanding what the community feels about these cases so that we know how to actually message not only juries back, but also the public, because we do need the public on our side on these cases. And it's so incredibly important to ensure that we get the right words out, the right message, so that we can tell a story. Because just speaking words isn't enough. If we don't tell a story about what happened, just like you did, you wrote a book about George Floyd. You wrote a story. You didn't fill the book with facts. You told the story of his life. And we have to do the same thing. Let's talk a little bit about the Justice and Policing Act and police reform in general, because I know both of you have been very proactive in terms of trying to get some laws changed. Uh, ben, could you start by talking us about your assessment of the changes on the state and local level, uh, whether you've seen enough, whether they've been effective? Well, I think on the state and local levels, they have been somewhat effective in the fact that they are trying to address the matter. Because I think as they teach us in you know law school, uh, notice is two thirds of the law, what uh, Tony Ramanucci, uh, Jeff Storms, and other great lawyers with our legal team, we we provided the notice. If they didn't already know with George Floyd, they were then on notice. And then once you're on notice, you have a duty to do something about it. And so you had over, you know, 150 cities and states ban chokeholds after George Floyd was killed. Uh, and, and conversely, uh, you had over 50 banned no-not warrants after Breonna Taylor was killed. And so you saw on the state and municipal level, people trying to be responsive to what we had articulated for the world uh, through the tragic killing of George Floyd. But what did not happen, Robert, it still hasn't stopped it. And that's what we're fighting against. You, you can say, we did all the effort in the world, but if you keep killing my child and we keep losing our family members, then obviously we haven't done enough. I think about Amir Locke that uh, Attorney Ramanujan and Attorney Storms and I are working on uh, on these no not warrants and the fact that, you know, after Breonna Taylor, right there in the city where George Floyd was tortured to death, you know, the mayor and them said they're going to ban no not warrants. 
But yet, they keep doing them, and a mere lock is laying on his couch, sleep. The police kick open the front door in the wee hours of the morning, very similar, eerily similar to Breonna Taylor, and they put a bullet in him even before we believe he was consciously aware of who they were. And what we're saying is we have to not just pass laws in theory, but we have to have them have uh, impact in reality because our children are dying and they're being killed by police at a disproportionate rate and we have to do something about it. And I know you didn't ask about the federal level. We'll get to that, I'm sure, in a little while. But, you know, if the Senate doesn't come together and pass meaningful police reform, which they have not done since, uh, I believe, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, great society legislation, then it's incumbent upon people like Tony and I, advocates and families, to press harder on the state and local level because doing nothing is not acceptable because we've been to too many funerals. Yeah. So can we talk a little bit about what you've been seeing in Washington? Because I remember talking to you at the one year anniversary and you both had a feeling that there were just some terms to be worked out for the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act on the federal level. What's your sense about what happened? And uh, Tony, you can start, but that, that we'd like to hear from sure. both of you. Yeah, you know, Robert, I, I ultimately, I, I don't know that either one of us has the answer as to what happened, but what we think, what, what we know did happen was this. It was a slippery slope and it was a downward slope. Um, it started out very optimistically. Uh, the families came out in, in droves. Uh, we met with uh, many of the, of the Senate members, uh, private meetings. They were very positive. Uh, we came back a second time, a third time, a fourth time. And each time we came back, we saw that the, that the body language, uh, the words that were being used weren't as optimistic. And we kind of had a feeling of, of dread as, as the summer went along. And as we got into uh, Labor Day, you know, we had a feeling that it's not going to happen. Uh, there, there, were, there were too many hurdles that, that needed to be, uh, that, that needed to pass and, and we couldn't get over them. And the promises that were being made uh, or were made weren't kept. And, and we, we kind of saw the writing on the wall. And it's, a, it's certainly a shame because the, the local issues that are happening, you know, the, the bans on chokeholds, the ban on no-knock warrants, uh, you know, the, 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 the use of body-worn cameras, that's all very helpful. But those are one-off. We need much more uh, overall accountability, and we need that national database. Uh, we certainly need police officers to be prevented from moving from one jurisdiction to another after they commit civil rights violations or uses of excessive force. The public needs to know about those sorts of issues. And until we get that sort of accountability, uh, that public transparency, we're, we're still gonna struggle in this country because uh, I, I haven't seen enough of what should have happened since George Floyd. Yeah, Ben, I mean, you, you all tried so, and so hard. I'm wondering when the last time you had, you've spoken with uh, Senator Scott or Senator Booker about this. Um, is this dead on arrival? What, what's happening? Well, um, Senator Cory Booker and I have talked about it. I have not talked to Senator Scott, uh, I think, since the last time Attorney Ramanucci and Attorney Monique Presley and others engaged him in person at the Capitol. Um, but to answer your question directly, what happened? It was, they put politics over people. I mean, they, you, you did not get one Republican to reach across the aisle and say, based on this torture video that we just witnessed, 
we don't feel compelled to do anything differently in America. And that is very tragic. The killing of George Floyd was tragic. What the United States Senate did in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, I believe was just as tragic because what they ensured with no federal reform is that we were going to see other acts of brutality against marginalized people by police over and over again with no responsive leadership to deter such. Yeah. I mean, Tony, we've talked about a little bit about your journey from your time as a young lawyer in Chicago, learning about these issues. And I'm wondering, when you think about both trying to convince a jury and trying to convince legislators in Washington, uh, which group do you think is harder to convince to move in a way that's effective? Uh, there, there's no doubt, Robert, that it's harder to convince uh, the legislatures and the politicians because they have agendas. You know, at least with the jury, we get the opportunity to question them before they actually sit for a trial through a process called voir dire. We get to find out if, if a juror, potential juror, actually has a problem with this particular case that they're sitting for, and we get to excuse them. We, we don't get to excuse our politicians like we do jurors. We, we don't get, um, you know, uh, a politicians of our peers, so to speak, because even if we elect them, they seem to do what they want to do sometimes without really listening to their constituents. And that's what's so frustrating yes. because there is no doubt, there is no doubt that a year ago where the court of public opinion was on this issue, and that was to get something done. And instead what happened, like Ben said, they, they put politics over people and, and, and it's quite a shame and I could use much stronger language um, over the fact that the George Floyd Police Reform Act was not passed. Uh, the, we, have, we had no better opportunity than this event to really have wide, you know, wide ranging, wide sweeping reform in policing, and we blew it. What do you think, what do you think we can do? What do you think can be done? Well, Tony. I think uh, you said to me, Tony, uh, who would you want to ask that question? No, go 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 for it. Okay, um, and I'm sure Tony can chime in. Uh, he's brilliant on these matters, and that's why I'm so proud to work with them on the front lines. Um, what we can do, I believe, Robert, is do everything we're doing to not lose the moments when you have them. You have to seize upon them. I think getting President Biden to sign an executive order would be not what we wanted. We wanted a law, but it would be incremental progress. And we have to continue to try to make progress no matter how small it might be every day. You just keep chipping away, you chip away, you chip away, but you never give up. You can never give up because our children are worth this fight. Uh, you know, I believe that marginalized children of color, young people, are going to help make America the greatest country that it can be. But it's going to take us respecting and valuing every black and brown and red person out there and not marginalizing them just because the color of their skin. And so I think we have to get executive orders. We have to get uh, state legislatures. We have to get cities, everybody trying to do whatever can be done to address this issue so that if that takes these families going to bear their heart in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma with Terrence Crutcher or Botham Jean with Dallas, Texas or Amir Locker in Minneapolis, whatever it takes 
to try to make sure their death was not in vain, we have to do it, Robert. And it's going to be a struggle, but I am always reminded of what the great Negro abolitionist Frederick Douglass said, without struggle, there is no progress. And so the fact that we keep fighting means that we're going to make some progress. Right. If I could, if I could, Robert, I, I, oh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go for it, please. I, I, I would love to, you know, respond to this because I think this is so critically important. We, we have a piece of information now. We have a document from the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, which was um, the Governor Walls commissioned the MD, uh, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights after George Floyd was killed to look into patterns and practice of the Minneapolis Police Department. It was found last month. They came out with their conclusions that indeed the Minneapolis Police Department has a pattern and practice of racial discrimination against black people over white people uh, without question. It is so wide ranging in terms of how big this scope is in their discrimination. Now, here's what's important. That's only one of 18,000 police departments in this country. And if anybody believes that Minneapolis is the only racist police department in this country, then we need to have a talking to because there are many, many others. And that's why Ben and I, you've heard us say that Minneapolis Police Department needs a do over. Well, now we actually have the proof. We actually have the proof that it needs a do over, whether it needs more funding or less funding, probably more funding to figure out what went wrong there. That's what they need in order to get this done. And so do a lot of other police departments. So along with this document, and hopefully in the future, executive orders, Ben and I will be able to continue to go around the country and speak and speak about reform in a meaningful way. You know, one of, we've talked about moments during those nine minutes and 29 seconds and the ones that had come before that have really impacted us. I know, Tony, you talked about uh, George Floyd saying to the officer, I'm not a bad guy. Ben, I know you had talked about, I can't breathe. For me, it was when he looked in the officer's eyes and said, uh, why don't you believe me? Because I felt it said something very deep about this country and the idea of black people walking around, not fully being believed by a person of the state. Um, I'm wondering now, and I know a lot of people are wondering, about the Floyd family themselves. And as they look to our, look at this two year anniversary, I'm wondering if you've had any discussions about them and where they are in terms of thinking about the future and justice. Ben. Well, you know, you know Robert, most of them have been uh, zealous advocates for reform and helping to shape the legacy of George Floyd. Uh, and I think about your your great book that you wrote, how it chronicles the fact that George Floyd was like any other black person in America. The fact that, you know, any of us could have been George Floyd. When you look at his family lineage, that his grandfather, you know, had 500 acres at one point and he got swindled out of it. He got uh, it got taken from him by racist actors, and it goes to show, you know, that this racism and discrimination has to be challenged whenever it rears its ugly head. Because could you imagine if George Floyd's grandfather would not have been swindled out of the 500 acres, what kind of legacy that would have started in motion for his family and what George Floyd would have been in American society versus what America perceived him to be. Yeah. And we have to look at the, the full length and breadth of how we get here, how we get to a George Floyd, how we get to a Breonna Taylor or a Maude Aubrey, because it's so much bigger than these individual acts. It's like uh, Attorney Ramanucci said, it's the pattern and practice that exists, but it's also the powers that be that allow them to exist in American society. 
Right. We're running short on time, and I know a lot of people there right now. There was a poll that came out in the Washington Post that talked about the lack of optimism there is, particularly among African Americans, that things will get better. I know the call for justice and to do the right thing really gets you guys up in the morning. But I'm wondering if you had any words for those who are troubled as we head out of this in terms of thinking about what can make you rest? Like what allows you to go to bed at night? Uh, we can start with Tony and then we'll go with Ben. Well, it, it's I, I don't know yet what, what we can say to make you rest, except that know that you have people that will continue to work this. I think one thing that we have to do, must do, in order to get people to rest is we have to get police to change their narrative. I'm in Chicago. I can tell you right now that we're sitting on a narrative that is just not to be believed. I, I don't want to hear police officers every morning telling the same story, the same narrative, in order just in order to justify an excessive force case against the black person. I, I can't tell you how people need to change that narrative so that you can speak like a human being, so that people can understand and so that they can regain trust. When when you when you spin a false tale, when you spin a narrative, just like the medical emergency that George Floyd supposedly had. Uh, as a result, because that, that's what he died of originally was, was a medical emergency, not not as a result of being choked to death. That is what causes um, the, the mistrust in this country. And, and that's where we need to change the arc. If we can change that curve, people will rest much better knowing that the police are on their side and they're not spinning tails in order to justify the use of force. And Ben? Yeah, and in essence, what you're asking, Robert, is when will black people uh, be able to exhale? When we we be able to breathe? Uh, since you know, we think about George Floyd. Last words: I can't breathe. Um, and obviously, Buffalo is heavy on my heart as we speak. And I think about the young white supremacists going to kill those 10 innocent black people in the Topps supermarket. And I think we will be able to exhale when we see some semblance of equal justice where there are not two justice systems in America. That is our lived experience. The fact that you know, even young white men who are confirmed mass murderers get the benefit of the doubt, the benefit of consideration, the benefit of possibility and professionalism, the benefit of humanity, even when they have done some of the most inhumane things. That's why they keep taking them alive. Dylan Roof, uh, the Parkland shooter, the, the young white man who killed the Asians down in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and then certainly this latest young man who they talked down without firing a single shot. But then we look at how they treat George Floyd, how they treat, you know, Terrence Crutcher, walking away with his hands up unarmed, how they treat both of them, how they treat so many hashtags that we've come to know. And I think we... Mm -hmm would be able to breathe when we see politicians, see those black young people like they see their own children. Because Thank you so much, Attorney Crump. I'm sorry we're running out of time. You know, oh. I'd go on for hours with you all. Yeah. Uh, but thank you, thank you for joining us so much. And thanks to all of you for watching. Uh, this is Robert Samuels from the Washington Post. Uh, be sure to check out WashingtonPostLive.com for future for future interviews. And thank you for joining us today.